some of the nation's top academic leaders. This week at Penn Law's Advancing Inclusive Leadership Forum, we bring together the nation's distinguished business leaders and thinkers for a conversation on how we can join the vanguard of leadership during a time of great crisis, but also time of opportunity. This conversation will shape the first of its kind leadership educational materials developed through conversations with leaders. Several of my students, specially chosen leadership scholars, will be joining the program and their insights animate this conversation. I want to thank Cheryl Hardy and the Penn Law Executive Education Program for their commitment to inclusive leadership. We engage in this conversation at a critical moment in history, and I want to very briefly trace some tipping points that have helped shape this moment. First, starting in 1971, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg challenged laws and rules on the basis of sex, and her legacy continues to combat the way in which sex-based stereotypes in work create separate spheres for women and men which reinforce, in her words, the impermissibly cabined notions of men as breadwinners and women as caregivers. In the five decades since her path-breaking legal strategy as the ACLU's and our nation's women's rights jurist, women have made progress in the marketplace, yet there's been less movement on men's advancement in the domestic sphere. In the early 1990s, Kimberly Crenshaw gave us a new language to speak about intersectionality. 30 years after Crenshaw gave us the lexicon to speak of the way in which race and gender interact to shape structural discrimination and the multiple dimensions of the experiences of women of color at work, as well as at home, today, Isabel Wilkerson gives us a new language to speak of subtle, and often invisible biases. Modern day caste protocols, she writes, are less often about overt attacks or conscious hostility. They are like the wind, powerful enough to knock you down, but invisible as they go about doing their work. The hierarchy of caste is Wilkerson writes about power, which groups have it and which do not. The year 2020 will be the year we look back on as the year that changed everything. The dual forces of the pandemic and the mass public reckoning on gender and race have exacerbated the fault lines and revealed new political, racial, social, and gender divides. Against the backdrop of a leadership crisis, this perfect storm has led to a racial justice social movement that is today both global and multiracial. The social movement is also backed by a business movement. Corporations have pledged the financial weight to address systemic and institutional racism. The Me Too public reckoning on harassment and sexism continues to wield its power, toppling men in power and bringing women and their stories to the forefront. Women heads of state have emerged as those steering their nations with vision and compassion in combating the twin forces of an economic and health crisis. Even before the world as we knew changed, there was a conceptual shift in the understanding of the business purpose. In 2019, we saw a shift from Milton Friedman's idea of a shareholder capitalism to an idea of a stakeholder capitalism and corporate purpose is now at the forefront of a fundamental and heated debate with rapidly growing support for the proposition that corporations should move from shareholder value maximization to stakeholder governance and capitalism. The Business Roundtable, a powerful CEO lobbying group led by JP Morgan, agreed to an updated definition of the purpose of a company that recognizes responsibilities to a larger ecosystem of stakeholders. But a recent study financed by the Ford Foundation, the test of corporate purpose finds that signatories to the new corporate purpose pledge have done no better than other companies 
while failing to distinguish themselves in pursuit of racial and gender equality. Since the pandemic's inception, the study concludes the business round paper statement has failed to deliver fundamental shifts in corporate purpose in a moment of grave crisis when enlightened purpose should be paramount. So in the final analysis, what we know is that a crisis is looming in corporate America. And the Women in the Workplace McKinsey report just released last week is a wake up call to all of us in a state of sleepwalking. In some it states, no one is experiencing business as usual, but women, especially mothers, senior level women and black women have faced distinct challenges. One in four women are considering downshift in their careers and leaving the workforce due to COVID-19. This year's report makes one thing clear, without bold steps, we could roll back the progress we've made toward diversity. But if companies rise to the moment, we can lay the foundation for a more equitable workplace in the long term. So this forum begs the question, how can we rise to this moment? So during this first session, we bring together the nation's top academic leaders from law, the liberal arts, and STEM. We have joining us from Wellesley College, President Paula Johnson, and from Stanford Law School, the jurist Deborah Rodi, the nation's foremost scholar on leadership, Dean Sujay King Liu from Berkeley University College of Engineering, and Dr. Sanjay Sama, Vice President of Open Learning at MIT. My first, first question to you is to President Paula Johnson. President Johnson, you were the first African American in the history of Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital to be chosen as chief medical resident. And you are the first black president of Wellesley College, leading the, the most distinguished women's college in the United States. I often say that when you enter the room, you change the electricity just by walking into a room, just by your presence, President Johnson. Your 2014 TED Talk on his and hers healthcare garnered over a million views worldwide and is now more relevant than ever. It revolutionized the way in which we understood how women experience disease. You speak about NIH's Revitalization Act of 1993 and its mandate that women and minorities be included in clinical studies. You look at heart disease as the number one killer of women in the US and depression as the number one disability in women in the world. And the sex differences make all the difference in healthcare of women and minorities. And in light of COVID, these findings now have even more resonance. What I would like you to do is to briefly address your understanding of gender bias in health and medicine and speak to the disparate impact of COVID by race. What has this revealed about systemic racism in healthcare and in society and in business? And how do we address race and gender bias in health and in business going forward as we look to clinical trials and the distribution for vaccines? Professor Johnson. Thank you, Rangita, and thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. And it's wonderful to be here uh, with you and with my other colleagues um, here, several of whom uh, I've had the honor to meet with in the past. So, you know, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for bringing together uh, a conference that really focuses on uh, inclusion and innovation because. Uh, I think linking the two is critical to our future. And let me just briefly, what the question, the pr pretty broad question you asked, I could probably give a treatise on, but I'll just uh, try to cover a, a few um, high points. And, and that is that, you know, for, for many years, when, when I first started uh, my cardiology training and research career in the early 90s, um, it was very clear to me that studies really lacked inclusion of women and minorities. None of the major cardiac trials 
uh, on major, major interventions included women. Um, and for most, for the most part, uh, women and minorities were really not mentioned. Now, how did that occur to me? It occurred, it occurred to me, obviously, because of my identity. But where, where did it come from? It came from, I think, really a strong liberal arts background. And I turned back to my own college career um, where my eyes were open to some of the inherent uh, sexism in the way we think about biology through who was then uh, the first bio tenured biology professor at Harvard, and that was Ruth Hubbard. So it was really that, that opening of my eyes to really think about research differently, think about inclusion differently. So fast forward to the 90s, you know, and it was... Um, quite clear that this was a major problem. What really made the, the tide change was the, the year of the woman, the first year of the woman in the 1990s, um, when you had a major influx of women into Congress after the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings. And what that did was it, they, they came together in a very bipartisan way and focused on the fact that women were excluded from actually at that point, what was one of the major cardiac trials that had come out, which was the Physician's Health, uh, Heart's Health Study, which focused on aspirin and the preven prevention of heart disease. It was from my own institution, Brigham and Women's. It was, uh, it was a national trial, only included men, and they were outraged. Um, they got together and essentially legislation was passed in 1993 to include women and minorities in adequate numbers in phase three, so later phase trials. So fast forward to my own career, it had become very clear that, that um, NIH, quite frankly, wasn't really living up to what the law had, um, had demanded. And um, before I came to Wellesley, um, I founded the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology and a division in women's health, really focused on these sex differences. And we actually focused on science, on the basic science, on the clinical science, the translation of science to clinical care, and then how could we take findings along with other colleagues across the country and really uh, move policy change and I won't bore you with all the details, but just to say that um, after some very important sentinel work um, in, uh, in about 2014, um, in 2016, the NIH finally um, uh, instituted new rules that required the inclusion of women and minorities in all phases of clinical trials, so early phases, as well as in more basic research. They had to think about sex, in cellular research uh, and in research um, across the across a number of fields, the FDA did the same thing. The jury is still out in terms of of what's happened, and and we know that the data that we've gotten since 1993 have been very helpful in letting us know that inclusion matters. There are significant sex differences, and when they're not accounted for, you get average results, which average is not good for either women or men. So just a few words about COVID, because I think we're living in an era where history repeats itself. Um, I think it's, it's no surprise to anybody here, COVID has really laid bare the deep inequality, um, racism and sexism, uh, and the intersection of the two in our society. And we see this in any number of ways. It was uh, only really after April that um, the CDC, the federal government, started requiring um, the recording of sex um, and race actually in data regarding COVID. If you look at the early data, um, it, it was really sorely lacking. It's still lacking in many ways, but it wasn't even uh, a major issue. Um, if you look at who's impacted, so the social factors of our society, the intersection with, with COVID. If you look at sex and race, uh, we know that Blacks are 13% uh, of the population nationally, but actually are 20% uh, of COVID deaths. And we don't even have data um, intersecting uh, uh, both uh, race and sex, okay? So we don't have those data routinely reported, and we know that Women of color, Black, Latinx, 
um, indigenous populations. Um, we are on the front lines. They are on the front lines of um, care providing of essential workers um, and also hit by these deep inequalities that are rooted in, in really uh, both racism and sexism. Um, so what that has led to is really a quite a dire uh, situation. And, um, you know, as we think about how to address this, you know, I think that it's, it's a moment for us to take stock of the economic inequalities, the social and environmental inequalities, the inequalities in our science, um, and the inequalities in our healthcare delivery system. And those are just to name four, but they have all merged together to create what is quite an unequal system. Um, we talk a lot about vaccines and including minorities, uh, racial and ethnic minorities in vaccine trials. Well, that isn't really going to happen unless we address upfront the historical racism and abuse that has occurred over generations in the healthcare system, unless we invest heavily in better understanding relatively quickly how we get populations, more marginalized populations included. It isn't going to occur and we're not going to do differently in the future moving forward if we don't depoliticize CDC and also uh, really think about reinvesting in the WHO. Um, I could go on with other thoughts, but I think that we know um, it, this isn't an over, it can feel overwhelming. And when I talk to young people, sometimes it is. But if we begin with some of the basics, recognizing the issues and doing our work on our fronts to confront many of these issues, you know, we can begin to move the needle. And as a country, we need for sure a different level of commitment across the board. So thank you, Paula, for that very rich response. And I want this to be a conversation. So I'm hoping to ask Deborah Rodi to respond to your very interesting point that when you started this research on inequality in the sciences, it was very much driven by the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings. So how the inequalities in, in society the sex inequalities in the laws, in the legal profession, in the ways in which our um, hearings were conducted drove you to look at inequalities in the sciences and in healthcare and led to that path-breaking 2014 TED Talk, which as I said, garnered over a million viewers around the world. And I think really propelled changes in healthcare globally and nationally, and drove a public conversation on his and hers healthcare, which remains relevant to, to our conversation today on COVID and the deep inequalities that it has revealed and continues to deepen. So before I get to Deborah Rodi and I ask her to respond to you about that particular issue, I want to turn to another very prominent STEM leader, Dean Sujay King Liu, who's the first woman Dean of Berkeley Engineering and one of the first women on Intel's board. She has broken barriers for women in STEM. And I think despite the challenges that we are facing in this moment in time, we also see a moment of triumph when Berkeley's own uh, Jennifer Doudna was awarded the Nobel Prize for her path-breaking work on gene editing. The first time two women as a team were awarded the Nobel Prize. And uh, Dean, you have been at the forefront of changing the conversation on leadership. And I was so, um, so inspired and so tremendously uh, moved when you mentioned empathy as one of the important qualities of leadership that you look in making appointments, in making faculty appointments. You, what you say is you looked for technical brilliance, obviously that is a starting point, but then you look for, for empathy as a way in which leadership is measured and an indicator of measurement. 
And in your recent uh, talk given at your own alma mater, Stanford, you spoke about EQ, uh, which I think is so important, empathy in artificial intelligence. And you're really taking the idea of empathy to the next level, in the next generation of sciences. And you said that you wanted to become a dean, a leader in academia in order to address the digital divide and to bring your leadership to what you call interrupt gender and race bias in the academy and in the STEM fields. And you spoke so richly about how letters of recommendation given for women scientists and for male scientists show the unconscious biases that I spoke of earlier and how often you in your work as a dean, you unmask those biases. So what I want you to do is uh, growing out of Paula's comments on her work in healthcare and the ways in which that now informs the ways in which healthcare is being driven to Latinx and black women in clinical trials and in uh, COVID related healthcare. How do you look to hire more Latinx and black women in the tech industry as a way to address these larger forms of systemic and institutional racism and sexism? Right, well, thank you so much, Rangita, for inviting me to participate in this um, as a member of this August panel and to share my perspective. I think in, in the tech industry and in, in STEM fields in general, you know, we realize now looking back, if we look at the data, the percentage of women in, in these fields compared to the percentage of women who even, you know, graduate from college with STEM degrees, we can see that there's a rapid attrition of women um, as they progress up in, you know, senior level to senior levels of leadership in STEM fields. And so the first thing that we're trying to get the industry leaders to, to face is the data to show that okay, there's some un, un, very interesting attrition of women, and especially for uh, women of color, um, the attrition rate is, is much, much um, more troubling. And so the first step is to face the data and then to try to understand the root cause that there is unconscious bias, um, as I like that quote about, you know, the effect being more like the wind that can knock somebody down, but you really can't see it doing its work. Um, necessarily. So now in, in recent years, there have been a lot of researchers who've been looking at the impact of unconscious bias. So as Rangitha mentioned, in um, just simply in looking at CVs and resumes, um, there have been studies done in the science fields, physics and biology at eight public, large public universities. This is just one example of a study where um, the researchers presented uh, faculty, um, over 250 faculty with uh, resumes or CVs of prospective postdoctoral researchers. And identical resumes were given, except, uh, except that they changed the name. So you could tell whether it was a fe female or, or male, or if the, the um, applicant was uh, uh, from an underrepresented minority group. And clear bias arose, even over the same uh, CV, same accomplishments, uh, different names suggesting gender or race. Um, men, you know, Caucasian men were judged based, solely based on CVs to be more competent and more hireable than, than women. And then right, minorities were much more penalized, um, I mean, lower ranked, even though they, if they, even if they had the same uh, level of accomplishments. So that's just one, one thing that we need to be aware of is both men and women actually had this sub subconscious bias. So we're talking about male and female professors. Another way that um, we choose postdoctoral researchers or higher faculty um, is based on letters of recommendation from people whose um, opinion we, we value and trust. And uh, a, a different study looking at hundreds of letters of recommendation for medical faculty at um, a large US medical school found that consistently letters of recommendation when they praised men uh, would, would praise them as researchers and professionals, having innate ability to succeed. Whereas on, in general for the successful women, they would be described more as hardworking, very compassionate, dependable. So these biases um, are, are um, evident in letters of recommendation on which we base hiring decisions. And, and also 
um, standout letters. So in engineering, we actually look specifically for people who can become leading, you know, star, rising stars, who are rising stars, leaders in their field. And this term rising star or somebody who's most gifted or who has hit a home run, those terms are generally used more for men and much less commonly for women. So just first of all, increasing our awareness that such bias exists in letters of recommendation so that we can compensate for that when we evaluate candidates is, is very helpful. But I think fundamentally for people to even pay attention to the data or to want to educate themselves to increase awareness and to counteract bias, they have to understand the benefit of diversity. So just to tie back to you know, the legal profession, because this is um, hosted by Penn Law School, um, you know, diversity, why does diversity matter? I always give a couple of examples. For example, um, most of us ride in um, automobiles and um, the first ever airbag system in the early 90s really was designed to protect tall and heavy passengers because the dummies used to test the efficacy of these airbag systems um, was, or it was sized and weighted like men. And it took almost 20 years for the US Department of Transportation to update their standards so that car manufacturers had to also use dummies weighted in size like women. But by the time these changes, these legal, these laws were changed, regulations were changed, um, many more women and children had died in airbag related accidents. And oftentimes the airbags would deploy even though the car was moving at relatively low speeds. And, and because we're smaller and we have weaker necks, the women would get injured, serious spinal or, or head injuries or, or death, um, mainly because the airbag systems were not designed. Um, for for with women as passengers and or children in mind, and so you know one of there was a, a professor that mentioned well you know manufacturers and designers used to be all men in the early 90s or be earlier so it didn't occur to them that they should be designing for people like themselves and even today the seat belts are often very uncomfortable for pregnant women and so a lot of them don't wear seat belts um, properly and so that can lead to the more, a higher rate of death. Another example that's relevant today is artificial intelligence, not only recognizing you know, people, but voice, voices. So the first voice recognition systems, not surprisingly, um, were more accurate for male, male voices and for people who didn't have you know, um, strong accents. And this is important because um, Google estimates that by the end of t this year, over 50% of searches that are done you know, online are, are gonna be done by voice rather than by typing you know, things in. And they claim that their voice recognition system is 95% accurate. But then people should be asking accurate for whom? Is that for you know, um, American, Native Amer um, American born you know, Caucasian men? Um, this is important because speech recognition, as I mentioned, it has race and gender biases. And today we use, um, uh, I guess, more and more so AI, you know, voice recognition re responses to make important decisions about immigration, about job hiring, um, and, you know, in car navigation systems. I'll give you an example. Uh, when nowadays when we drive with the GPS, you know, na navigation systems in our cars, um, it's known that those don't work as well for women as for men because of our voices, the voice recognition system not being so accurate. And one thing that um, a car manufacturing um, executive mentions like, well, the solution's obvious. We just need to train women to speak with a lower tone of voice and <laughs> speak more slowly. Oh my gosh. This, so this is something that really happened. So this is why I stepped up as Dean to really try to train future engineering leaders to actually be more inclusive, to, to, to transform the culture of engineering. Because uh, with AI starting to you know, do dominate and, and, and affect, you know, change the nature of work, the way that we um, live, work, and play, it's gonna be more and more important that we have diversity of people who are actually gonna be creating the systems, the devices, um, and, and so on, that we are all going to depend upon in the future. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Dean. So the legal scholars who are going to be part of this conversation will now know why I made a deliberate effort to bring together the nation's leading STEM scholars because the way in which you are going to impact the future of the world, the future of work, is going to say a lot about the way in which the law can respond. So your conversation, your leadership is so pivotal to our own work as legal scholars and as lawyers in the legal profession. So that now takes me to Dr. Sama, another STEM leader who is the vice president of MIT's open learning, but is also, and this is something I often tell you, Sanjay, you are the father of IoT, the Internet of Things. And in your brilliant and spellbinding book on IoT and the inversion factor, you lay out a roadmap to human flourishing in this new age of IoT. So building on what the Dean just said, on the importance of recognizing, the first step of recognizing bias, uh, both in human behavior and then the way in which that bias then bleeds into uh, AI, I want you to speak of how the IoT market, which is expected to grow to a spectacular value of $1,256 billion by 2025, how you see gender and race being part of that conversation in designing the internet of things. Because if not, we're going to see a world that deepens those gender and racial divides in a way that we will not be able to close that divide or that gap. So Sanja, can you speak to us about your own vision for IoT and the ways in which law society and the internet of things can come together to address deep income inequality, race and gender inequality. Thank you very much, Rangita. It's a pleasure to be with this august group as a, both my wife and I are UC Berkeley graduates. It's particularly great to see the Dean and of course, uh, President Johnson, you and I have interacted a great deal in the past. So lovely to see you. Uh, in fact, I was with Professor Rode in a different session with Rangita some time ago, so really lovely to talk about it. I actually uh, feel that, uh, so in my book, um, what I say is that uh, when you think of new technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence or uh, IoT, what we do is we invent new verbs, new nouns, and we internalize it into a language of design. So for example, you know, why did Uber, uh, or Lyft, why did they do something Avis or Ford couldn't do? Because they spoke this new language, you know? I'll use a smartphone, I'll use a GPS on it, and I'll use the cloud, and I'll match a driver with a passenger. And, you know, they were sort of constructing a new business narrative with it. And when you internalize language, you start thinking that way and you start innovating. That's sort of the, the, the idea behind the book. Um, unfortunately, language is also a very powerful too. Language also, makes a lot of our um, implicit, um, unconscious biases, our blind spots, it bakes them in. Um, so for example, I said it in, in, in a previous session, the word hysteresis, which in engineering has all sorts of meanings, you know, important, profound meanings, has deeply sexist roots, you know? I mean, so a lot of the terms that we use in our language is um, diminishing of others. I was talking to a colleague of mine, Professor, Michel uh, de Graaf, who's, a professor, who's Haitian in origin. And he says, when you say something is voodoo science, do you not realize that that is my religion? You just, you just uh, belittled it so casually, right? Um, so language is very powerful. Now, what's happening is we're raising a whole generation to invent and create and so on. And I worry and I fear that on the one hand, we're giving them new tools like the cloud, et cetera. But to the Dean's point, we're t in my view, what we're doing is we're taking unconscious biases and we're baking them into not just our language, but also into our technologies. You know, at least unconscious bias um, recognizes there's a consciousness. You, know, you can maybe talk the person out of it, 
But when there's an AI system, there's no consciousness. It is soulless. So when it rejects a resume, it's doing so in a way that is soulless. When a human being rejects a resume, you have a hope of maybe saying, um, you know, you shouldn't have done that. That's, you were you know, showing a bias and maybe they'll improve, but that doesn't, you don't have that option with technology. So I'm really concerned because I think what's happening with technology um, is that we are going to bake in a bunch of mistakes uh, in part because we just didn't ask everyone and it'll get baked into the language. It'll get baked into the actual way in which the technology works. Um, you know, uh, it ba you know, you bake in the color of the skin. I mean, I wear an Apple watch and the Apple watch detects, for example, um, heart rate, the, your heart rate by shining a green light through the skin. The more the pigment, the less likely it goes through. Well, right there, you baked in certain limitations. So um, in my other life, uh, in my, with my administrative hat on, I'm the vice president of open learning at MIT, and we work with a number of schools, uh, um, all of them represented here, in, uh, in um, uh, distributing and sharing uh, uh, education knowledge um, through, with open courseware, et cetera. And the hope is that we can get the knowledge out there. But the other issue we have actually is the digital divide. And I have to say very honestly that when we started um, our open learning efforts, um, first with OpenCourseWare 20 years ago, and then um, uh, with MITx and edX about 10 years ago, and for disclosure, I sit on the board of edX, um, I thought that um, it would be the great bridge. And we tried, it's not like for lack of trying, I, I'm, I feel bad about it, uh, but it's not for lack of trying. Actually, I'm finding that almost every well-intentioned intervention can make things worse. Mm -hmm. And for everything we do with uh, open learning, I fear that some zip codes mm -hmm. benefit more and other zip codes fall further behind. And in this technology driven world, and I hate to sound, be a bit of a downer here, but I will sh sound a cautionary note. We need to fundamentally change. Otherwise we are diverging as society. Uh, and it's not just gender, it's not just race, it's also zip codes, it's, you know, class, et cetera, um, uh, economic, uh, so, uh, social class, right, et cetera. Uh, I'll just end with this, uh, with this point. If when it comes to gender and, and race especially, I really hope that somehow society figures out how to recognize, you know, entrepreneurs and fund them. We, are in a, we have a little bit of a cultish worship of the Elon Musks of the world. You know, he's a formidable person. But um, this, in my view, this worshiping also comes with the, another downside, which is the absence. And we need to figure out how to find, and they exist, these leaders from other backgrounds and really celebrate and encourage them because otherwise we're gonna lose uh, an entire population in the next generation. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Sama. And in your most recent book, you, it's a tour de force of the ways in which differences in learning and how different people learn. And there's one, I think, narrative that is so touching. You speak about this young scholar uh, that came to MIT from one of the most distant, distant regions of our world, right? and who then was mentored by main leaders from Berkeley and Stanford and MIT, his former principal um, from Mongolia. He's a Mon young Mongolian scholar. And the principal of his school was an MIT graduate and another young male ally who was studying for his PhD in Stanford. So this Mongolian scholar was really nurtured by other male leaders and that brought him on the next phase of his journey to MIT. And MIT then obviously gave him a platform to really change the world. So, and I, this is a conversation that I want, want to ensure keeps percolating and keeps growing. But the role of male, male mentors to nurture female 
leaders, female scientists in the most frontier provinces of the world like Mongolia needs to be addressed, Sanjay. Because when I read that story, it was such a powerful story, but all of the featured uh, personalities were men. The young Mongolian male who was uh, advised and mentored by these two amazing male mentors who had graduated from MIT. And I thought, where are the women? Why aren't there more male mentors looking out for more female, uh, um, female uh, creative minds? And I think that's why it's so important to have Paula Johnson Sujay uh, King Lu at the helm of both STEM, the liberal arts and the sciences, looking out for women and giving voice to women who are going to be the next generation of leaders. So I agree now you. I'm going back to link and I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Sanjay, because I do want all of you to respond to some of these issues. But uh, Deborah Rodi, you are the second woman on Stanford's law school faculty, one of the most cited women scholars in the US. So you uh, you really know something about the issues that Paula and Sujay uh, Liu King and Sanjay Sama have been speaking about in terms of the importance of language. You know, language has been a double-edged sword for you. You know, you, when you were uh, first at Stanford Law School, you approached the dean and you asked whether you could teach a course on gender and the law, he responded by saying, no, you're a woman. You should not be teaching another uh, woman-focused course. So you are somebody who's really attacked and challenged language and biases for over 40 years. And what I want you to do is, I had a separate question for you, but I want you to address what Paula Johnson mentioned when she spoke about the impact of the of the whole Anita Hill discourse had on the way in which she conducted sciences because it's so important to this current moment. And just to give some statistics to what Paula mentioned, 33% of all COVID-19 related deaths in the US have been African American, while they make up, make up less than 14% of the population. So you see the disproportionate impact on healthcare. So we are talking about life and death issues. So Deborah, I want you to look back at that moment in time of the Anita Hill uh, uh, hearings, but also look at this current moment when businesses are attempting to address the issues of bias, systemic bias, systemic racism by making enormous commitments. So Microsoft has committed over $150 million in the next five years to address racism and systemic discrimination. They have made attempts to hire and recruit from historically black colleges. So there is this call to action but in 20 years from now, will we look back at this moment and think that we have failed in responding to this call? So what will the action after the call look like? And how can, how can the law support these changes? And how can law schools and other academic institutions act upon what David Wilkins calls the obligation thesis? of building the next generation of leaders of color in the law and in business. Deborah? Well, um, thank you so much, Rangita, for this conference um, and that question and getting us to focus our attention on these issues of, of diversity, inclusion, and justice at a moment when uh, we are in an inflection point. And, um, Paul, I love the reference to the um, Hill Thomas hearings. And of course, you know, that was the famous year of the woman. After those hearings, it propelled unprecedented numbers of women into congressional uh, offices. It flooded the EEOC with sex harassment complaints, and people began to take them somewhat more seriously. Um, but, you know, it was, it was only a year. <laughs> you know, where are we now, um, decades later, with a fifth of the Congress still, only, you know, only women uh, or women only a fifth of the Congress, and the backsliding um, on responses to sex harassment was pretty quick. And as you pointed out, despite 
all of the efforts following that uh, landmark legislation um, to try to get uh, medical trials to be more inclusive. We're still bumping up against it in the pandemic when the initial data didn't come in with such important markers. So, you know, my sense is we're dealing with um, always partial progress and there'll be a moment, um, a, a catalyst for major social change. Um, and then, you know, fatigue will uh, surround us. And unless we are really committed during that window of opportunity to laying the foundations for sustained change, we will, as Rangita pointed out, look back 20 years later and say, wow, we kind of missed it. And, you know, I think what's happening now in the law um, is an important moment of reckoning on race and gender brought about, of course, by the killing of, of George Floyd and, and hashtag me too. But too many, I think, of um, the major players and leaders who are largely um, white men um, are not responding uh, to this moment in a truly meaningful way. Um, there's been a lot, I'll just um, call out law firms for a moment because Rangita asked me to talk about that. Just such um, shallow self-serving virtue signaling um, responses. You know, they, they, they issued a statement that um, uh, endorsed diversity inclusion and denounced racism and they promised some additional programming or a task force on it. And they co-opted lawyers of color to be part of the groups that drafted these um, token responses and, you know, ended up sapping time from efforts that many uh, lawyers of color thought would be far more productive in producing um, meaningful social change. Um, but at the same time, and here's where the complexity comes in, I, so many of, of um, these leaders, including lawyers, were well-meaning and fought, felt caught between conflicting messages. They heard that silence of complicity, but so is speaking out if it looks like grandstanding. They were told to use their voice and then told it was their turn to listen. And there was an interesting exchange between Anthony Appiah, who's the ethicist columnist for the New York Times Magazine, um, with a young college student who wanted to know what he should do, white college student at the, in this moment of, of racial reckoning. And he, he'd done some things, he'd attended protests and. Uh, written some letters and made some contributions, and he wondered if he should post on social media. And Apia offered a really nuanced response that I think speaks to our challenge. He said, you know, um, he was concerned about grandstanding, um, mainly actions um, that are motivated by, as he put it, the vanity of self-representation by a desire to show you're on the side of angels. But as he also said, virtue signaling isn't always a vice because even superficial statements, um, including social media posts, can help change the moral norms that then can help change the moral practices and can convince the general population that, that doing the right thing at this moment is necessary for social respect. But he concludes, it, there has to be more than talk. There has to be action. And so what is it that major institutions should be doing? Well, you know, there's some um, law firms that are leading the way. They make substantial financial contributions to racial justice organizations. They establish pro bono programs um, that work with communities of color to respond to systemic uh, racism. And they look for meaningful ways, concrete actions that will narrow the gap between our profession's principles and practice regarding equal justice under law. It's what we put on courthouse doors, but that nowhere describes what goes on inside them. Legal education, I think, has a similarly mixed but too often inadequate record. Law schools join the virtue signaling campaigns with statements and programming, um, but too few made significant commitments to reassess their leadership structures and their curricular and extracurricular offerings. And since this is a, a, a conference on leadership, I'll just once again point out the irony. Here it is, of course, um, at uh, one of the schools that's done the most. So it seems um, uh, we, sh we should put it against that backdrop of all that Rangita has done at Penn. 
But it's pretty ironic that the occupation that's most responsible for producing America's prominent leaders has done so little to educate them in the role. And with present institutions accepted, you know, although the legal profession is less than 1% of the population, we've supplied a majority of presidents, half of Congress, uh, governors, state legislators, judges, prosecutors, general counsel, uh, managing partners, heads of government and nonprofit organizations, and almost none of these leaders have received any kind of training, formal training for their leadership responsibilities. That's started to change. There's now a section at the Association of American Law Schools, an increase in teaching materials, and of course, new courses like the one that uh, Rangita has pioneered at um, Penn. But we need to do so much more. Um, you know, so many uh, faculty and students and administrators think that this leadership is some kind of touchy-feely curricular frill and not as important as doctrine. But, you know, people can learn doctrine later or they can look it up on the internet. Uh, things like cultural competence, self-awareness, empathy, emotional intelligence, um, that for lawyers, um, that soft stuff is the hard stuff. We're not good at it as a profession. And I think one hopeful byproduct of this nation's recent tragic experience with leadership failures at every level in the pandemic and in the protests following Floyd's killing is that maybe they're going to prod law schools to take the need for leadership education uh, more seriously. Uh, lawyers lead. Law schools inevitably produce leaders. And it's time that they do it more intentionally, informed by the best research and pedagogy, and committed to promoting um, diversity, inclusion, and, and racial justice. Law as a profession offers so many opportunities to do good, and let's hope that the recent crises have pushed more of us to think about what our contribution should be. And I want to thank Deborah because all of my work done at Penn Law grows out of <laughs> her, her canon on leadership. So as you can see, this well-thumbed book is what I use copiously, and her book on women and leadership, and her book on leadership for lawyers, and her 200 odd law review articles are the canon, constitute the canon that my students read. So my last question to all four of you grows out of that engagement that my students have with Deborah's work. So this is a question that they uh, have submitted to Deborah, but I want all of you to answer that given this moment of, you know, this uh, inflection point in the history of our nation and in our world, what is your level of optimism or pessimism for change? So I'm going to start with Paula Johnson, and I want you to respond to that question, but also to respond to the ways in which, you know, your colleagues on the panel have engaged and problematized some of the issues that you raised, Paula. So each of you will have three minutes to answer that question about your reason for optimism and pessimism, given this moment in history. So uh, Rangita, first of all, thank you. And I just want to say to my colleagues here, um, th there is so much to respond to, to your inspirational and highly reflective uh, remarks. And I'll just say briefly, I am optimistic. First of all, you know, as I say to people, I'm in the young people's business. And, um, and prior to that, uh, as a scientist in, in healthcare, that, it, that is an opt, th those are all based in optimism. But, but more importantly, I think that we're seeing, as we've talked about, converging factors that really require change. And I think um, if we look at our young people today, the people who asked you the question, Rangita, there has really been no major movement uh, at least in the United States, where young people have not been at the forefront. And I do think there is an igniting and electricity that is happening and an awakening and a convergence of issues uh, across many of the issues we've talked about that, that uh, gives me hope. But, but here are a couple of other thoughts, and it responds to a few of the issues that, that were brought up. This issue around, I think, um, the digital divide, Sanjay, I think as we think about educating our young people and what this means, 
you know, if I read another article talking about the, the flaws in the economic model of higher residential higher ed today, you know, what they all leave out is the fact that we uh, don't have equality and that essentially our campuses become the leveling ground. They become the places where young people from all over the world, from whatever backgrounds they are, they come and they are living together, they are eating together, they are working together. So we, we've got to remember in an unequal world, our institutions play an absolutely critical role. The other thing is we play a critical role in setting the stage for how we think about the intersection of fields. So this idea of of, of artificial intelligence and issues of, of baked in bias. Well, it is up to us to bring together the computer scientists with the philosophers, with those who are really studying other issues of women and gender studies. And it's true also in the medical field. I'm very worried about the gold standard, which is incorporated into AI. The gold standard, guess what, is not based on any real diverse data. So we, we've got a lot of work to do, and this is long work for the long haul. And um, we name it inclusive excellence, and it isn't about a program here or there. It is about structural change. It is about changing mindset. It is about really valuing those differences um, and being able as an organization to embrace them, um, as opposed to thinking you're gonna change those who bring diversity to be more the quote unquote norm. And then just the last statement I have just around, and I think Sujay, around the dropping out of, of women in particular and, and, and women of color in STEM, I think this goes for a number of fields. I think we still have to focus on this uh, rampant uh, problem of sexual harassment. I co-chaired the uh, National Academy's evidence-based study that was published in 2017. The numbers across all of STEM are still outrageously high. And we have got a lot of cultural work to do. We have to stop looking at just the individual quote unquote bad actors. This is a cultural <laughs> change and very much in line with what we're talking about today. Thank you, Paula. And I teach a policy lab on sexual harassment lawmaking and we read your report and your report is significantly informative in the way in which my students are now drafting a law on the virtual world of work. Sexual harassment has now gone digital mm -hmm. and the ways in which sexual harassment in the virtual world of work needs to be addressed is something that has grown out of your work in sexual harassment in the STEM area and the recommendations that you have made in that path breaking report. So I wanted to acknowledge that because my students from my lab are now part of this conversation as the next generation of leaders. Dean Sujay King Lu, your two well, minutes on responding to that question about pessimism and optimism for the future during this, what I think is an existential crisis, but also a time for change and hope. Yes. Well, I think President Johnson said it perfectly. Uh, and I am also optimist, optimistic because I work with young people um, also. And I think today the, the young people do care um, about shaping a future, uh, a world that is more equitable, you know, as well as sustainable you know, a fair society. And um, one example of that is, you know, as we are developing courses for actually to teach engineering students leadership skills, because I think in the future, you know, our country could use some more um, uh, leaders that have solid technical, you know, training. Yes. I think our, our engineering student leaders, they are actually imposing on themselves that all student organizations, at least the leadership here, when we have dozens of them, um, they have to undergo um, sexual violence, sexual harassment training in order them to, for them to have access to resources that the university provides. So I think that's just one example. And, and the leaders are, you know, in, including the white male, you know, the students, right? So that gives me hope for the future that we can close the, the gap, even as COVID-19 has exacerbated the gap, you know, the tech, technology access, digital divide, um, as long as we increase awareness of it and work together to close that gap, and all towards a you know better world for for all members of society, I think that we there is hope for the future. <laughs>
Thank you, Dean. Dr. Sama? Just, sorry, I just wanted to add uh, to what uh, has already been said um, and say that in addition to, I'm actually optimistic. Um, I just want to add one thing, uh, actually two little things. One is that in addition to the digital divide, which we really can't control outside, you know, it happens, you know, it's just the way circ circumstances work. But Tushik Mayan Bagar, the uh, Mongolian, young Mongolian you referred to, benefited because he was a boy. By the way, he talks about his sister, but we never heard of her again, right? He's a wonderful success story, but we just need to make sure that um, society captures that. And the reason for that is um, we talk about the digital divide, but there's actually what I call a mentorship divide. And so there is actually a wonderful book about it. I'm gonna hold it up, I don't know if you can see it. It's called Peak, The Science of Expertise. It was written by a very uh, well-known um, psychologist by the name of Anders Ericsson. And he talks about deliberate practice, which is how you can make anyone world-class. And it takes something only humans have the skill to do, which is coaching. I and mean, that's what parents do, right? We coach. That's what children do. They get coached. That's our entire um, principle of, that's where learning, that we're learning animals. That's where it comes from. It's a human prerogative. And coaching is more um, available to boys in society and to young men than to girls and young women. And I do think to President Johnson's point of point, educational institutions have a unique role and an opportunity um, to address that. So that was sort of the first and most important point I want to make. The second point uh, I want to make is that, um, you know, in the innovation world, we forgive a lot of stuff because it's all sort of quick and, you know, you want to make a decision and make a sale and, you know, and in that our um, unconscious biases, we sort of let people get away with it, you know, a little bit because we say, well, you know, they were trying to innovate. Those, you know, they had to get the product out. And, and in those circumstances, the instinct, I think, takes people to what they're comfortable with. And so both on the coaching realm and in an innovation realm, I think we need to, I don't know how to do it, but we just have to work harder to equalize the playing field for young, for girls and for young women and for women in general. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Sanjay. And Deborah, I'm going to ask you to deliver the last words of this opening keynote session. And I want to draw on your own inspiration and your own thesis where you say at the heart of moral leadership is influence. So I want to thank you for influencing a whole new jurisprudence on leadership in law schools in the United States and around the world. And going forward as Suje King Lu thinks of educating the future engineers in leadership, I would urge her to look to your own leadership treaties as a way in which to draw inspiration and pedagogical methodologies. So Deborah, please end this keynote session with uh, with a response to what everyone else said, but also to my students' question on, is it pessimism or is it optimism that really drives you to think of the future? Well, I, I too want to end on a note of optimism. Um, and I agree with what's already been said, uh, but let me add just um, three forces that I think will um, push us um, in a path toward progress. Um, first, demography is with us. If you look at the changes that are happening in the United States, you know, we, we are going to be a nation of people of color uh, very soon. And our, um, we will not have le a legitimate, credible leadership structure if it does not reflect that reality and the pool of talented people is changing. And I think our institutions are realizing that in order to remain um, uh, competitive in a global society and to address the enormous social problems that we face, we have to take full account of the nation's talent pool. Um, and that forces us to diversity and inclusion um, as a strategy and a solution.
Secondly, I think in many ways, um, technology, despite all the challenges that have been pointed out, can also be our friend. Would we have had the George Floyd protests if it hadn't been for cell phones with cameras? We are now able to capture in real time and post on social media without any intervention of, of, of the press or other gatekeepers what is actually happening um, to communities of color. And that's just ignited the social protests in a way that um, I think you know, we saw somewhat during the civil rights era with um, uh, you know, uh, sort of the Birmingham uh, dogs and bull whips um, uh, unleashed against uh, peaceful protesters. But we have an even greater tool when anybody can post those pictures on social media. And think of Susan Fowler, the engineer at Uber, who was harassed on her first day at the job. And, you know, HR blew her off and said, oh, you know, you're a unique case. Um, and he's a high performer and wouldn't do anything. And she had screenshots of the emails. And she also found that he was, unlike what HR said, a serial predator. And, you know, when she couldn't get the attention of the leadership um, of the company, she, she left and put it on social media. And you know, uh, after uh, an investigation by former Attorney um, General Eric Holder, 20 executives lost their jobs at Uber. And that wasn't because of law. Um, that was self-help ramped up. Um, and that's the age we're living in. And I think there are ways to take advantage of it. And finally, I do think that the efforts that have been made by everyone in, in this room and so many outside it to make leadership structures more inclusive are having a real difference in the cultural narratives um, and the conversations that we're having. We have a critical mass in Congress now who pointed out the problems with the data collection. We have a critical mass of uh, women and people of color um, in major media institutions. And that helped force coverage of hashtag Me Too and the investigative journalism that made it possible. And we're seeing at every level, just as we look at who are the pictures on this stage, the fact that institutions are changing because of the people who are in them now and who are seizing the moment and inspiring, most importantly, the generation who will follow them to be committed to these issues. And I think it is so important um, that we have these moments to reflect on the enormous progress that we've made, the challenges that lay before us, and the energy that can be mobilized by the students who are taking the course and uh, the professors um, like Rangita who are inspiring those change makers. Um, for a future that desperately needs them. Thank you, Deborah. And just on those words of wisdom, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that the next session brings together distinguished leaders from Africa so that we could be informed and shaped by the wisdom of African leaders who are leading at the cutting edge of politics, of technology, of public service, and those who have learned at the feet of the great Nelson Mandela. And that session is going to be led by Gay McDougall, one of the most, I would say, leaders in the United States who has bent the arc of leadership towards justice in a way that she and her husband, the great uh, leader who argued the Gratta cases, on behalf of the University of Michigan's affirmative action case. So we are thrilled to have started off this extraordinary conversation on inclusive leadership with four great leaders who are using the platform of their great academic institutions to build the next generation of inclusive leaders who are going to create a more equal world. So thank you, Paula. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Sujay, Liu King. And thank you, uh, Sanjay, for joining us and sending us off on an extraordinary conversation. Thank you, Rangita. It was wonderful to be with all of you. You all. Thank you. Good to see you all.